This is Marcia, daughter of Varro, also named Yaya. Marcia is one of the very first known female artists of antiquity, a sculptress who specialized in engraving ivory, and a painter renowned for her portraits and self-portraits. She was born in Cyzicus in the first century BCE. Her name was mentioned for the first time by Pliny the Elder in the Natural History, written between 33 and 37 BCE. He noted that there was no painter superior to her for expedition in the Rome of her time. In this miniature from a 14th century manuscript entitled On Famous Woman by Giovanni Boccaccio, Marcia has been depicted by an unknown painter who portrayed her in the style of an early Renaissance court. We see her in an ornamentally decorated chamber, which is her painting studio. She is seated at the dressing table, holding a mirror in her left hand and a paintbrush in her right. This is a woman who is wholly engaged in studying her own anatomy. She is exploring it, recording it and preserving it. Her portrait appears three times in this painting. In the chamber, in the mirror and on the panel, in three different images of self. She is portrayed and portraying at one and the same time. This is thus a multiple portrait of a person who both is the object and the subject of their own observation to the same degree, and who further down in a line also becomes the object of the onlooker's observations. What connects me to Marcia? It's certainly more than just gender and occupation. I think this painting represents one of the key moments in the process of women breaching a restraint, namely the shame and fear of speaking about themselves and their own bodies through art. In this short visual essay, I shall discuss how I am searching for ways of representing the female body in my artistic practice by creating collections of notes concerning its various states, movements and feelings, in other words, its bodygraphy. One of the methods used by social scientists studying other cultures is participant observation. It involves the researcher entering the environment they will be studying and observing it from inside while taking part in its daily life, like all the research participants, integrating with them and adopting their standpoint. At the same time, though, the researcher will also be documenting their own observations through note-taking, photographing, filming and sound recording. The difficulty with these methods lies in the fact that the researcher has to set their own views and convictions to one side as they become a member of a new environment and follow the customs and beliefs that hold sway within it. The multiple portrait of Marcia examining her anatomy became my starting point for research grounded in the study of my own body and environment and their various states within the broad context of art, the humanities and medical aspects. Involving the representation of Marcia, I created my own multiple portrait recording a moment of my work. Echoing the composition in the medieval miniature, I placed myself at the center of my studio against a backdrop formed by part of my library, my art tools and my equipment alongside my research notes, medicines and everyday objects. That in turn eventually served me in drawing up a map of my research which is situated at the intersection of artistic practice, theories of illness, concepts of corporality, the third wave feminist theories which are developing on the basis of psychoanalysis, and in particular the concept of the body as a multi-element and dissolved structure. In particular, my areas of interest revolve around the spheres of polygraphy, the original term I coined for corporal writing and body text. I use it to define a spectrum of personal, individual and cultural group experiences embodied through movement, sound and writing. 
I connect photography with the notion of the subject as an integrated bodily intellectual being whose forms and methods of expression are accomplished not only through discursive language, but also through gestures, behaviors, sound and writing process in both private and public spheres. My concept is located close to Elizabeth Gross's theory of corporality. This Australian philosopher shows that it's in fact through the body that every experience occurs. This means on the one hand external experiences constituting the sensory, historical and cultural inscription, and on the other hand self-reflection. In other words, the internal experiences, the rational, conscious and subconscious inscription. Gross recognizes the body as the subject and not a being dependent on it or belonging to it. To illustrate the cohesion between external and internal, she uses the Mobius strip as a metaphor for the relation between body and mind. She also postulates a search for a form of woman's self-representation, which would involve producing new discourses and knowledges, new modes of art, and new forms of representational practice outside of the patriarchal frameworks, which have thus far ensured the impossibility of women's autonomous self-representations, thus being temporarily outside or beyond itself. Another sphere, which bodygraphy is somewhat akin to, is the concept of the body as a sign of self analyzed by French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy. What he has in his mind here is the union of the body and text which caused them to become one. Breaking away from the hierarchical differentiation between that what is written and that which is presented with the help of writing. In my artistic practice, when I unite the act of writing with a performative process and corporeal narrative, I am invoking the concept of excription of the body put forward by Nancy. Here, writing is a kind of extension of the body and in a broad sense of corporeal and motorial experiences. With this context as a springboard and participant observations methods as a focus, I follow the behaviors of my own body. Triggered by particular states and events, it produces a specific form of expression, creating its personal photography. One of my works which is rooted in the concept of the excriptive body is Book of Hours, a three-act performance art piece rooted in somatic techniques involving identifying, observing and analyzing the body's motorial patterns. I adopted this technique to the study of the exploration of my body's behaviors as it experienced the protracted pain, breathlessness and chronic fatigue that condition my way of function every day. In total I collected around 65 figures, gestures and positions and they formed the starting point for work on the piece. I work on the Book of Hours in collaboration with multidisciplinary artist and choreographer Kozro Adibi in August 2019 on a steady stay in a 19th century building, High Green Manor in Northumberland. However, the process that eventually gave rise to the prize had begun a year earlier at High Green during my artistic residency there with visual arts in rural communities. That was when Kozro and I started workshopping together. The space where I performed Book of Hours is the manor's former bathhouse. In other words, a bedroom, an isolated place stamped with particular meanings. On the one hand, a bathroom is a sphere of cleaning and ablutions, of rituals performed privately. On the other hand, it's close to a sphere which is profoundly somatic, physiological and abject, demarcating an area for something located between subject and object, something simultaneously organic and beyond organic, animate and inanimate, something which can be extracted from the body, secreted by it, which is part of it, but a burden to it, something 
It reacts to it with incertitude, anxiety, relief or pain. With unconditional and instinctive behaviors. With atavism, with struggling, with casting off and even with madness. At this point the body manifests affective and biological reactions which are both intimate and humiliating and which reveal the inevitability of death. Depending on the context, the bathroom is thus a zone of comfort and discomfort, a sphere where the perception of one's own body and identity is transformed. I created Book of Hours by combining movement, touch, rhythms of breathing and voice, expanding their sensations with experience of the imagination and dynamics of my body's sensitive construction. I relied on the movements I was prompted to make by my body, which is in pain, but strives to adapt to the pain or cope with it. As I reconstructed movement in pain, I was endeavoring to sketch an outline of its impacts of my body's routine and to study the extent to which that experience shapes my movement disposition, affects my corporal narrative and deconstructs my corporality, teaching it a new material code. In the balletic tradition, specific learning methods and techniques help dancers to remember choreographed combinations of movements and gestures. Dance anthropologist Annie Peterson royce remarks that dancers rarely see the sequence itself. What they reproduce is the combination of steps that they've used as a mnemonic device. Stylistic nuances that don't spring from the way the dancers have been trained are superseded by the basic techniques which provided a familiar shared reference point. Royce believes that this phenomenon is the result of embodying technique, which is grounded in the ballet dancer's linguistic knowledge. In other words, inculcating through dance a lexicon of technical terms, which inviolably shape and universalize the fundamental elements of the form. As such, if a figure that the dancer performs has no name in the language of ballet, which is French, then it will be foreign to them, it will be other. So the power of language establishes the position of the body. Language inscribes itself in the body and its behavior, and it will not permit the body to forget. Contemporary female dancers and choreographers with a background in classic ballet, such as Rosalind Crisp and Lisa Nelson, for instance, developed their own pre-choreographed and improvised dance performances and at the same time review and strip away the learned patterns of dance movements. So how does that work in the narrative of illness recognized by the body as alien, as foreign, as otherness? When the body develops new beyond language orders of communication, how far apart are speaking with language and speaking with the body? Is movement devoid of words still the same, meaningful gesture? Or does it become abstract? Does it deform it, reinforce the message? Does language steal the meaning of movement? The history of literature offers proof that the narrative of illness is still in search of language. Virginia Woolf called attention to this in an essay entitled On Being Ill, asserting the place of the ill body in literature. Fifty years later, French philosopher Helene Sixot came out finding for the necessity of speaking about the body. Referring to Écriture Féminine, in other words, women's writing springing from the body, she urged women to write through their own experiences of corporality. It was in acknowledging those arguments and perceiving that the necessity of combining corporal experience and narrative order is not my need alone, but lies deeply rooted in the humanities, that I draw up the central field of my research, female writing through the experience of the ill body, 
art-seeking ways to express and represent my ill body through both discursive and visual languages, treating it as part of a person's identity, but also seeking ways to avoid flaunting illness as an attraction, emotional blackmail and cliches. The author of The Wounded Storyteller, American sociologist Arthur Frank, who had heart disease and cancer, was the first person to juxtapose extracts from his diaries dating from the period of his illness and a scholarly dissertation, creating a new kind of academic narrative, a narrative conducted from the standpoint of one's own illness. To describe his stories, Frank chose the term illness narratives, following Arthur Kleinman, who used it in a medical context to define both the story that was told by a patient and concerned the meaning of the illness they were going through, and the story constructed by the doctor while listening to what the patient was saying. Since then, social medical researchers have been accepted the biographical and autobiographical story as a particular kind of narrative. These narratives have become crucial to contemporary medical and cultural research as tool making it possible to communicate knowledge about the storyteller's condition to those around them on the basis of quoting the narrative and analyzing it. As a trace illness narrative and ways of conveying and self-representing the ill female body in the history of art and literature, I've been studying selected aspects of two female Polish artists, Halina Poświatowska and Alina Szapocznikow. At some point, the work of both was related directly to illness. Halina Poświatowska was a Polish poet who suffered from chronic heart disease which she contracted as a child. It was an incurable condition in the Poland of the 1950s. She introduced the theme of the ill female body to Polish literature through her autobiographical works, and in so doing, she revolutionized women's writing at the time, including erotic writing. Throughout her life, Poświatowska struggled with breathing, speaking, walking and laughing, and she lived in chronic pain. She was literally the prisoner of her ill heart. In her poems, the heart as an organ always plays against love. Love is erotic unfulfillment, desire and waiting. It's an emotion which is always in conflict with physicality, and it's always the loser in any confrontation with the body. For the greatest strategy in her poetry is neither parting nor conflict but death. Two antagonistic forces collide in her writing, Eros and Thanatos. Poświatowska's poetic language goes hand in hand with her biography. Her poems are a unique emotional illustration of experiences of the extreme. She builds her identity from them. They are intimate diaries where she herself stands at the center, confronting her own body and suiting her fear of death. She is a subject defined by her given name. She gazes at herself in the mirror of her text and draws her own bodygraphy with words, like Marcia. Hasia. Hasienka, don't be afraid, don't. You have such pretty lips and such eyes, you know. You will pause those pretty lips, close those pretty eyes and curl your palm into a little fist. Hasia, Hasienka, you had a polka dot dress, you had. You like to jangle with necklaces, you liked. And the city which comes at night, you loved. You did. Look, it's not so far away. They say the sky. Look, it's quite close. They say the night. 
and you will return to the city. Will bloom with a name on those lips. Hasha, Hashinka, it's time to go. Come on. The sculptress Alina Shapochnikov was the first Polish visual artist to work with her own corporality, which she studied in social, cultural and existential dimensions. The way she created her bodygraphy differed from Poświatowska's. Her life story was marked by the loss of loved ones and her experiences of war, the Holocaust, migration and illness. In 1949, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis paratinitis. At that time, she wrote of corporeal life as flesh and organs, saying that Sometimes it seems to me that that life is unreal. And it's unreal because it's purely corporeal. She was treated with streptomycin, which made her infertile. That had an impact on her dynamically evolving art, where corporeal and female motifs began to appear. In 1969, she was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. At the time, the main subject of her art was her own body. Her practice, grounded in the celebration of female sensual corporality, transformed to an anatomical vivisection, the archive of her own self, a diary of her illness. Her tumors, invasion of tumors, vest tumors, tumors and tumors personified series emerged. The majority of those works have very bodygraphical character. They are biomorphic forms created in synthetic materials in which the artist immerses waste from medical procedures, pieces of dressings and glasses, personal items, photographs and print marks of her own body. They are a map and a mirror of her corporeal experience, her narrative of her illness and attempt to record and preserve her own biology, physiology, and humanity. Because as she herself said, my artistic gesture is aimed at the human body, this entirely erogenous area, with its undefined and ephemeral feelings, celebrating its impermanence in the recession of our body and in the traces of the steps we take on this earth. Through cast of the human body, I attempt to preserve in translucent polystyrene ephemeral moments of life, its paradoxes and its absurdity. I'm convinced that among all manifestations of impermanence, the human body is the most fragile. It's the sole source of all joy, all pain and all truth. And this thanks to its ontological poverty, which is as inevitable as it is at the conscious level absolutely unacceptable. I imagine Marcia at work, studying herself in the mirror, analyzing her appearance for a moment, the proportions of her face, the setting of her eyes, the shape of her nose, lips and chin the sculpture of her cheekbones, her complexion. Now her gaze shifts to her palette. She finds the colors, mix the paints, glazes at the mirror again, turns the attention back to the panel and the lens over it. She executed several brush strokes and then her eyes is turned back towards the mirror. Marcia is following her own image, tracking it, tracking herself. Her gaze is mapping out her activity, a choreography of self-observation. The word choreography derives from the Greek and combines two elements, chorea and graphy, which translate as dance and to write or writing. So choreography is not dance in itself, but a notation of dance of the dancers' bodily movements and gestures, and of the time when they are executed. It's the art of notating, organizing and composing movement 
which becomes dance. When I was working on Book of Hours, I had a score for my movement. It looked like this. It notes the position of my body and its location in the space along with the timing of a movement and its tempo. As I look at this drawing, I see all of my movements executed at the same moment, simultaneously. One glance encompasses every detail apart from the emotion, intuition and tension between the body and its motion. They make the appearance when the work is performed. And they are different every time. American dance anthropologist Adrienne Kapler remarks that the dance notation is not a shorthand system, but rather it necessitates a detailed analysis of the movement of every part of the body as it moves through space and time. However, in order to notate accurately, it's helpful, indeed almost necessary, for the notator to be able to perform the movements himself in order to analyze exactly what the various parts of the body are doing and in what sequence they are done. I think that this necessity may well have been the greatest challenge I faced, because the score for a book of hours was based to a large extent on movements of the body laying down, but I deliberately performed them in a vertical position. This was a step in the direction of breaking away from the schematic perception of the ill person and of illness solely through the prism of horizontal experience. What we have here is the direct and systemic notation of my movements during one day of the coronavirus lockdown. This is the choreography of preparing three hot meals a day, laying the table, doing the washing, washing up, working at the kitchen table and cleaning up split rice milk, a mug that has fallen to the floor and the day's entire mess. It's also a record of forgetting, hesitating, making mistakes and reversing a movement, returning for a teaspoon for the salt for a mug. This is why something else also interests me, not only in body graphy, but also in a choreography. Using anthropological methods, I collected data on my body's movement, mapping the tracks it took, the ways it moved, and how many times I went in and out of the kitchen that day? Well, 17, rather than merely how? And how many times I stretch out my arm to open this piece of cupboard? 7. However, those methods also enabled me to study the trajectories of my gaze and my hearing. My interest is not only in how, I move when my body is experiencing a crisis, but also where I'm looking. What's there at the end of my gaze? What's the choreography of my sight? And what sounds catch my attention? So by extending the participant observation method and incorporating the shadowing variant where the anthropologist selects a member of the society or community under study and follows them, I shadowed my own eyes and ears. And this is what denotated choreography of my gaze during a medical treatment lasting several hours looks like, when reduced to a minute-long miniature. When Lisa Nelson was endeavoring to find a way of working with the body which was both new and far removed from the rigorous structures of ballet, she picked up a camera. She treated it like an extension of her body and studied its reactions, activities and the synergy of body and senses in that way. Working with a camera, framing shots and editing intensified her conviction that improvisation is a matter of the dancer's choice of movement and the decision they take. The camera allowed her to rework learned patterns of movement. That, in turn, 
had an impact on her dance practice where the body equipped with its own perceptive apparatus has a function akin to the cameras, framing everyday experiences and transforming the act of observation into action. I think that the body reacts similarly in illness. Self-observation of daily experiences enables it to develop new practices and election of behaviors which it employs at moments of crisis. In addition to feeling, seeing and perception, the body has internal and external radar which carry out a continual dialogue with its surroundings. Although its gaze does not encompass all of its parts, and it sees itself only fragmentally when it's reflected or projected, then as a multisensory being the body emits and absorbs stimuli and approaching micro changes within both the compass of its own structure and its surroundings. Confronted with the unknown, alien and unidentified, the body generates a range of supporting, suiting or fortifying actions learning to move in a new way, which is far removed from its standard movement. Indeed, it's quite often perceived as non-normative by the body itself. Royce writes of how moving in an idiom not one's own creates physical sensations that certainly contribute to the feeling of otherness. When we move beyond the initial discomfort of unfamiliarity, we began to understand that otherness in a very fundamental way, in an embodied way. During the Middle Ages, a phenomenon known as Koryomenia had a similar basis. Koryomenia, which is also known by a number of other names, including dance plug, affected hundreds of people at once. They would dance and dance until they dropped. Like a plague, it spread through the cities and towns of Europe. Today, during the pandemic, a corresponding role is fulfilled by raves, mass dancing and movement practices perceived as behavior which is alien, inappropriate, unbalanced and socially irresponsible. What they have, though, is a transformative power which supports survival, and what lies at the end of the case of every dancer's performance may well provide to be healing process, understood in the widest sense. The Oxford Dictionary gives 15 examples of the verb to perform. They include the artistic to entertain an audience and they also highlight the medical uses of the word, like perform an operation to save somebody's life and the new drug has performed well in tests. In the sense of to do something, example a piece of work, the verb also has a social context, which is exemplified by perform a vital service for the community. This scope of the performative act combining an artistic, a therapeutic and a social processes confirms my conviction that the excription of the body need not necessarily be strictly linguistic in nature. The body's expressiveness is reactive. It responds in the here and now. So the present is movement, performance. It's transformative and dynamic. In this respect, the body's movement through its integration with gesture has an influence on reality, just like an act of writing. This, indeed, is how Nancy sees poetry as a demonstration of the present. This is a place here for the bodygraphy of Poświatowska's stories. At the same time, Nancy situates the act of articulating the body at the limit of discourse, at the fracture when the body becomes text, in touch. This, in turn, 
is the place for Shapochnikov's objects. In addition, the narrative nature of corporality demonstrates that the bodygraphy of the ill body is not only transcribing its experience of movement and its affective experience, it's also reading its symptoms. It's body reading. The points where my language and my movement hook up are located in my body, as Gross has remarked. As I see it, it might well be one and the same point. And even if it's not anatomy trying to adapt to language, but language striving to adapt to anatomy, what the body is saying does not stop at what is purely discursive or visual. Not, it's mediative in nature. And words cannot seize control over something which the body senses as unknown. What they can do, though, is gradually adjust to this alliance, this alderness, remaining in a state of permanent movement research. In this context, art becomes a tool which is not so much therapeutic as methodological, an instrument used for the purpose of physical reactions to the symptoms of one's own illness. It provides the ill person with a chance to shift from the rule of patient into an inclusive relationship with their surroundings. Here, art is an opportunity for developing the practice of social inclusiveness, because what could appear at the end of the gaze is an order. The portrait of Marcy is a miniature, and as such, it's an incurrent part of the On Famous Women manuscript. The scale of the painting is minute. The mirror is less than one centimeter in diameter. The image is just one tiny part of the folio, and it's interlaced with text which contains a semi-fictional biography of the real female artist, who was Marcia. Boccaccio embroidered and embellished her. In part, he even imagined her. In themselves, miniatures are an engaging artistic form, tiny and detailed, and require particular attention from the viewer. They have not only a poetic context, but also a political one, since the authors of illuminated manuscripts were most often women who work on them anonymously. The model of the woman who engages in art, creating small-scale works of modest design, which differentiates her output from that of men in terms of the choice of techniques and subjects, was described by Giorgio Vasari and took root from the 16th century to the 20th. The scale of my works is dictated by my body's condition, which often makes it necessary to minimize the effort involved. This is work carried out in emergency mode, which is why I value the meaning of micro-movements, small-scale formats and projects which are modest in size. The title of my Book of Hours performance artwork alludes to the medieval prayer books, which contained devotions for various times of days and a wide range of intentions. They were illuminated, but since they were also practical and convenient, they tended not to be large. The performance art piece itself, which consists of three brief episodes, is a form of practicing mindfulness of the body and its micro-changes. It's also a way of working and being present in a small space where I can inscribe myself physically on my own scale. A similar motivation accompanied me as I made a miniature video essay entitled OBS and the kitchen performance art piece. They were both based on my observations of my domestic choreography during my daily activities, where the rhythm and the dynamics of my movements changed and gradated even though they were made in the familiar landscape of my home. The domestic space is no random matter here. It's an unseen private sphere 
cancelling everything which is dispensable in the exposure of public space. For centuries, both the anonymous work done by women, including caring, and the experience of illness have reminded at the margins of male art with its focus on great themes. This is why for me invoking the creativity of those women miniaturists is an essential phase of the search postulated by growth for modes in art and forms of representative practice which are located beyond the framework of the patriarchy and afford women autonomic self-representation. <laughs>